I welcome everyone to another Multi-Hole Solutions webinar. Um, as we do each week, uh, we're just going to uh, wait for all of the registered participants to join in. We've got a number of registrations today, so it will take a couple of minutes for us to uh, allow everyone to uh, come online. And then we're going to commence this month's webinar. We've uh, in 2021, we've changed our program to a, a monthly series. Uh, everyone seems to be back at work and very busy again uh, here in Australia, especially uh, as the uh, impact of COVID is diminishing in our part of the world. Uh, so we've uh, made the decision to uh, reduce the frequency of these webinars to once a month rather than the once a fortnight and once a week uh, that we were doing last year to keep everyone entertained. Today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Trevor, Maggie and Sarah Joyce with us, who uh, are the owners of Mariner Boating Holidays. They've been involved in that business or owning and operating that business for many, many years. And uh, as we did in the middle of uh, 2020, we had a great webinar with them on the, uh, on the Western uh, areas of Turkey and the Greek islands. And the feedback from that was so strong that we immediately decided to book them in for a, another webinar, which is today's one where we're going to talk about the east coast, the eastern coast of the Lycian coast of Turkey, which is effectively from Marmaris East. But I'll let Trevor do most of the explaining when he comes online. Uh, we have him there at the moment, uh, sitting patiently and waiting. And I'm just going to flick through a couple of slides. Um, so yeah, really excited about today. I've had uh, the pleasure of uh, doing a rehearsal with Trevor and Maggie and Sarah uh, earlier in the week, and it was um, it was it, it, there's a lot of information, uh, a lot of slides, but uh, in the Mariner boating style, it's very informative. So you you actually will feel like for the next hour that you're uh, enjoying a uh, a documentary on the Lycian coast. Just flicking through the slides. Um, Okay, bear with me as we do. It's always a little bit uh, clunky. I'm just trying to change the slide there. There we go. So, um, so sorry about that a little bit of uh, uh, issue there. We, ha we are missing one slide and that is a slide where we would invite anyone who wants to ask questions today uh, of uh, Trevor. Uh, you can do that by clicking on your Q&A um, uh, button at the bottom of, the, uh, of your screen there. If you type the question, uh, Rachel and myself in the background will then just check the questions and we'll decide whether we're going to interrupt Trevor and uh, ask the question at the uh, point in time where he is in the presentation or we'll hold it over for a question and answer session at the uh, end of the presentation. But please do ask questions, we welcome them, and it certainly adds to the, uh, the quality of the presentation when we have uh, uh, the interaction of uh, those people who have joined in. Uh, the next webinar is uh, the Destination Vanuatu, and that's gonna be in one month's time. Uh, on New Caledonia with uh, Down Under Rally. We've had two previous Down Under um, webinars and they've also been very successful. So with the partnership that we have with the Down Under Cruising Rally uh, people and Mariner Boating, it's been really good in the last year to be able to bring some different content to the uh, multi hull Solutions Yacht Sales Co webinars. So that is on the 29th of April, 2021. And if it's uh, like any of the previous Down Under Cruising uh, webinars, it's going to be a very popular one. So make sure you're registered because there is a limit to how many people can uh, can view on the day. If you can't or haven't seen any of our previous webinars, you can go on our YouTube channel, multi Hole Solutions, and you can uh, register there as a multi Hole Solutions uh, YouTube. Um, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can go back and view all of our previous webinars from the last 12 months. And there's also a lot of other video content on there. Um, so, and the, the viewership of the, all of our uh, videos has been very strong and we really uh, enjoy the fact that the people are going back and, and re-watching or going for the first time to watch the webinars. Now, going forward, so I think I've been on this screen three times by accident. So I'm Greg Boller. 
uh, the New York Sales Manager at Multi Health Solutions, and in the background, as always, uh, producing uh, today's presentation is Rachel Crook, and uh, together we uh, uh, thank you all for joining us today. So it looks like everyone is that was registered has joined on. So we're now going to mute me, and I'm going to unmute Trevor, and I'm going to let Trevor and Sarah and Maggie say hello and go and start chatting. I agree. Am I on air? Hello. Yes, you are, Trevor. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, Greg, yes you are. So I'm going. Hello, Maggie. <laughs> It's great to be here and again, and I have a syndication opportunity to tell you about very quickly, but I want to introduce what I'm saying today by something that I think will be the case. If you have not been to Turkey, but you go, Turkey will astound you. Um, and I'm sure that when you come back, you'll have a different point of view about Turkey as a country and the people. Um, than you had when you left. And this has been said to me so many times now, and we've been going there for how long? 25 years? More, more, more. 30, 30 years? Okay. Um, the other reality is that um, there's only one way to experience at least the coastal part of it properly, and that is by boat, because much of it is not accessible by land anyway. And um, if you need a boat, there are three ways to go. One is uh, to buy a boat, and many Australians have done that. And if you want to do that, then Greg's your man. You can buy a share in a boat, and I'll tell you about that in a second. That's where we come in with YSM. And, or you can charter a boat, which is actually our core business. And we have uh, an Astria 42 scheduled to come out of the factory in December 2022. There are six shares in the boat. There will be two more sold. Four have been sold already. And a one-sixth share entitles the owner to five months during each season and then a month in the off-season. The cost of a share is uh, 115. Sorry, we've got a special on today. It's 110,000 euros and getting cheaper in Australian dollar Terms, as you may be all aware, the Aussie, for some reason, is on the march and appreciating against Euro. The management of the yacht will be done by YSM in conjunction with our partners in Marmaris, and I'll tell you their name, SK Yachting. They are a fantastic outfit, and if you already have a boat in the Med and you need some help, you go to Marmaris, you go to the marina, and you will find... Uh, SK Yachting. After commissioning and preparation of the yacht in La Rochelle, the, the Astria will be delivered to Marmaris and spend its first year of three there. And then in the second two years, it'll be in Croatia and in Italy. And so the base in um, Marmaris is in Yacht Marine. I'm sure some of you are familiar, especially if uh, you've already got a boat and you happen to be on air, and there's, um, this yacht marine is quite a big marina. The base operation there is, as I said before, uh, SK yachting. It's a beautiful combination of Turks who do all the work and Germans who sit in Germany and make all the orders. No, that's not true. Anyway, I believe Metin is listening. Uh, good, good morning, good night in Metin. Aside from the charter fleet that they operate, which is almost exclusively Fontaine Peugeot, bar two yachts, they operate and manage 40 privately owned boats, including Dufour yachts in their base in Marmaris. All the skills and facilities are available there at better than European prices, I can assure you of that. Now, if you're going to go to, Istan, to Turkey, of course, you're going to land in Istanbul. Sorry. <laughs> and the map that you will follow is probably a bit newer than that one. Um, this was done in about the 14th century, but uh, Istanbul recently built a new airport. It is now the biggest run, 
biggest airport in the world with 12 runways. Yeah. Now I may, Sarah's having a bit of a trouble moving. Here we go to the next slide. It would be a travesty to go to Turkey and not stop in Istanbul. And uh, we have an overland package in connection with the rally that we're going to run in May 2022. And you can travel by land down to Marmaris, or if you don't have the time or don't want to do that, you simply fly to Marmaris. Of course, Turkish food is fantastic. Turkish is a surprising country as an agricultural producer. It is a net food exporter. That picture on the right there is a cistern under the city where they used to store their water and they plagiarized uh, columns from other buildings to construct this uh, cistern. Curiously discovered when a fisherman was found sitting in the footpath pulling fish out of the cistern for dinner. This is the Blue Mosque, uh, which was built by the first Islamic uh, conquerors of, um, of uh, Turkey. And um, it's a, an amazing structure. Even today, the guys can't quite figure out how they managed to span the distance that they spanned when they built it. Then you travel overland from Istanbul down to Marmaris, you go via Gallipoli, of course, and the Dardanelles, and you know what that story is all about. And then from there, you go to Kushadasi, Ephesus, and this is a very famous archeological site in a global scheme of things. That is the library of uh, Ephesus, and curiously connected by tunnel underneath the roadway, to the brothel. I don't know quite what that tells you, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> then Bodrum, of course, is also a fantastic place in Turkey. We don't go there on the Lycian rally, but uh, Bodrum was the headquarters of the Crusaders in that part of the world. And that is the castle that the Germans, the French, and the English built between them. And it is now a museum, absolutely stunning place to visit. And of course, Bodrum itself is fantastic as well. So now you've arrived at Marmaris and this is the beginning of the Lycian coast, which goes all the way really to Antalya. The Lycians uh, inhabited this neck of the woods uh, from about 2000 years BC. And uh, hence, it's today called the, Lys the Lycian Coast. Marmaris is a fantastic town, busy, busy, of course. It has an awful thing there called Bar Street with 80 or 90 bars, one after the other, making a dreadful noise at night. And if you're not into that sort of thing, you just stay away from it. This is uh, the waterfront in Marmaris. There are two big, three big marinas there, probably with accommodation for about two and a half thousand yachts. But the, the yacht marine that we use is at the southern side of Marmaris Bay and therefore not right in the middle of town. One of the great things about Turkey is their music. And what is surprising to me, they play sort of free, free form Turkish equivalent of jazz. And they will play a single piece with everybody knowing every song in the audience, dancing around together, and they'll do it without interruption from 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night when they start until it's time to go for breakfast. The other thing that's fantastic to do in Turkey, in any one of the towns, is to sit down outdoors for a meal. And frankly, Turkey these days is inexpensive. I don't want to use the word cheap because it certainly is not in that sense. 
And just to put that in perspective, the exchange rate on the Turkish lira today is about 6.04 lira to an Aussie. And uh, when we were last in Turkey in 2019, we seem to have missed out on 2020 for some reason. Um, <laughs> the, the exchange rate was just over four, so it's gone up by nearly 50%. Uh, and you're buying, of course, in local currency when you're there, and so it's inexpensive. This is the first leg that we sail out of Marmaris. It's uh, due east, as you can see. And just for people who may be on their own boats traveling independently, please make a note not to go into that first bay that's double-headed. That is where the US Fifth Fleet is based along with the Turkish Navy and the military population in there is something between 20 and 30,000 people and they don't really like visitors. So you just keep going gently past. In fact, we sail with that little island to port when we go across there and we go into this place called Ekinçik. And if you want to get cute, when you see, see and this is what, um, this is what Greg just did. When you see the C, you pronounce it ch, as if it was ch, ek and chick. Anyway, it's a landlocked bay. It's a beautiful place there to tie up to. And here's the typical berthing in Turkey. In this case, it's moorings. And um, you take the lazy line to the stern, to the quay, pull the boat in and you don't have to worry about anchors or any of that stuff. Yeah, always plenty of assistance on the key. Same story, plenty of spectators as well. <laughs> Here's the other neat, neat thing about our rallies. We try to sit people, not with any great pressure, to sit next to their fellow crew members which means automatically they're sitting opposite somebody they don't know, especially first night, second night, et cetera. And we include these dinners in the rally program at the end of each one of the passages. It's a set menu. Turkish wine is uh, surprising. It's not expensive, even though it's heavily taxed now because they're trying to discourage people drinking, but still a bottle of wine is how much, Sarah? I have no idea because I don't drink wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, Trevor. Yes, mate. So, Trevor, you, you, how many times have you cruised up and down this coast? 30? Oh. Maybe 25? Wow. Okay. And, what, and while we're rolling through this, give us a sense of whether you think it's changed dramatically in the 25 years or that you still feel that there's a lot of the similar um traits that brought you there the first time i think it's not dramatically changed especially if you're on a boat another good reason to be on a boat because you can get to the bits that you can't reach otherwise the turks uh, 20 or 30 years ago did some awful stuff with development of hotels in places on this particular coast there isn't a lot I would say some of the bigger towns are now noticeably busier and noisier. Marmaris is a classic example. Fethiye is another one. But frankly, Kalkan, Kash, Kekova, Finike, Antalya, I would say pretty much the same. And no matter, even if you do go into those bigger places and you can see examples of those hotels, you can still easily get away from it so you know you access it if you want to and you don't if you don't parts of it are different and lots of it is exactly as it was each of these and the food experience is same sorry say again i was going to say each of these places have retained their old towns fairly intact i mean there might be different um operators in some of the old town shops but the old town shops are still there um, and this is the same in all of these towns a lot of them have been developed the first time we ever went to marmaris 
the old town was all there was. And that was way back in the uh, 70s, late 70s. Yeah. And Sarah and Gabriella were children and we wandered up the hill into the old town of Marmaris and that was all there was really. The market behind and the, um, the, the, uh, mon the mosques, but that was it. And then we came back the next time, it was probably the 80s, late 80s, and suddenly there were hotels all around the bay. But the old town is still there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, thanks. Thanks for that, Trevor. We'll let you move on. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. So one of the excursions we do um, that uh, is near Ekinchik is uh, up the Dalyang River mouth, which is first of all an acknowledged turtle sanctuary for the their egg laying, and um, that's in evidence there if you're there at the right time. But as you go up the river, uh, you're going towards the lake. And uh, this, by the way, if there's anybody here old enough, and I'm not sure there will be, but Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn combined in this part of the world to make uh, the African Queen. And um, nobody needs to admit that they remember the film. Next. Same story, traveling inland, the lake is over there to the right of that picture at the back and it's quite a big lake, freshwater lake, a little bit tidal, not much, but here are the Lycian tombs. This is where they used to bury their dead, of course. One of these tombs, the one on the right, is not completely finished. That was because they uh, came across Alexander the Great who arrived on the scene, and it wasn't uh, the industrial disruption that caused the halt to the work, it was Alexander. So this is about 300 BC that we're talking about here. This is the ancient city of Kaunas in the same neck of the woods on the same excursion. We kind of facilitate those trips, don't necessarily package everybody into them. If you don't wanna go, you stay home. We try to alternate lay days with days that we're making a passage. So if you want to take the day off, you do. If you want to do something independent, you do. If you're happy to be escorted around the place with a tour guide, this trip, for example, is very, very interesting. So then the next hop is to the east. That uh, blue line there is about 25 miles, I guess. And we go into the Gulf of Fethiye, and actually the uh, Dalaman Airport is just near Gocek, a little bit northwest of where you see the town there. So it's very convenient. And um, there are 50 anchorages in that bay that you could go to every hour, and they'd all be different. But the one we go to is called Sasala. We've been going there for some time. He'll probably do a roast uh, lamb in the oven, slow roasted, and it'll just uh, really um, get to your taste buds, I can assure you. So, hey, Trevor, yes, mate. Trevor, I just need to interrupt for a minute. We just had a very good point from one of our um, uh, participants. Please. Who were just pointing out that currently Turkey is still in lockdown and that, that uh, that the restaurants are, are closed and just starting to reopen. And I just wanted to clarify for everyone, today, today's presentation is, is about sailing in Turkey and the Eastern coast and the Lycian, but it's it's generally aimed on the logic that this is about what we go, what, what can be done in 2022 and 2023 and beyond. Uh, yes. We're not necessarily talking about uh, sailing in Turkey this year. And at the end, we will be showing the information about uh, our Mediterranean escapade, which is scheduled for 2022. So we're not necessarily talking today about sailing in Turkey this year. Well, I should add, um, uh, Greg, that uh, it's interesting to note that the Turks have already vaccinated twice 4 million people, and they do have 80 to, in front of them. 
they've done the first vaccination once um, already. They started in January. Uh, the regulations are changing, um, but uh, that's certainly a big proviso basically on whatever we do. And frankly, we see our first realistic possibility of doing anything in Turkey to be the season of 2022. Cross your fingers. Yeah. You right? And anyway, so keep going, but I just wanted to clarify that. We're not sitting here thinking that we're all going sailing in Turkey this season no. as much as we'd love to. Yeah. The other thing I was going to comment about with this picture is that this is what you would find to be typical uh, coastal conditions in the absence of a prevailing wind that they call there the Meltemi. Uh, this is coming off the shore and, uh, sorry, to the shore. And, uh, you know, 10 to 12 to 15 is basically it. And if you do get a Meltemi, it's typically from the northwest and uh, or from the west, depending on how far east you go. And 25, 35 or more is not uncommon for a Meltemi and they will blow for a couple of days as well. But the further east you go, the less uh, prominent is the Meltemi. Sometimes we have a race in those conditions. So this is uh, Sarsala, it's inside the Gulf of uh, Fethiye. The guy on our right is, on your right, is uh, our technician and uh, chef, teaches Turkish cooking. He speaks Greek, uh, French, Italian and Turkish uh, and obviously a qualified captain and he's been on several trips with us as our co-host. And basically he is the interface between us and the local population, how to go, where to go, how much to pay. If this is broken, we fix it. If you need this to fix it, then, then I'll go and find it. The guy on the left is the owner of the Sasala and uh, he, he will do this outstanding slow roasted lamb in the oven for you um, as part of the deal. And then if you look at how these boats are moored at his place, his restaurant is the only mooring possible other than at anchor out in the bay. Once again, you can see the mooring lines. They are not chains and the water is perfectly clean. Nobody hesitant about swimming, even where the boats are. Here's another typical anchorage, especially in the Gulf of Fethiye. These pine trees come down to the water. They have a beautiful scent in the evening. And uh, once again, the water is clean, can be a bit tricky getting a hold sometimes with an anchor. Um, always use plenty of chain. The water here is about six meters deep, maybe 6.1. And um, you just, well, you don't tie up to a tree because you run the risk of ring barking it, but you tie up to something, preferably a rock. And of course, when you get to go check, um, shopping is the name of the game. It's a very popular place with the Brits. Lots of them have houses there, um, but uh, carpet shopping is a big pastime. And frankly, it's a lot of fun. And we have a classic story with one of our clients, uh, not in this particular picture, but he was at Loggerheads with a negotiation with a carpet seller. There was a space between them, what one wanted and what the other one wanted. So our man said, I'll toss you double or nothing on the difference. And he did that and lost and happily paid the guy, I think it was 500 US dollars. Um, but just as likely the guy would have said, forget it. But uh, they are fantastic bargainers, negotiators, and they're fun to deal with. Here, yeah, this is again typical of uh, the Gulf of Fethiye, and quite often, frankly, it's a bit windless as well. Um, you see the mountains in the distance. You can't from this distance, but you can see in the late May, early June even, those mountains are still covered in snow. 
This is the entrance to uh, what used to be a volcano crater. It's uh, Ola Denise at the foot of uh, Papadag, which is uh, a mountain behind it. And uh, this is no longer open for boats to go into other than small boats. Yachts are not allowed to go in there because they made a mess of uh, the uh, water there with oil because there's basically no exchange of the water during the course of the tide. The tide, by the way, in Turkey in the Med is no more than 30, 40, 50 centimetres. Uh, so it's not a huge tidal movement. And if you do get a bit anxious, you just catch a cab up to the top of Papadag and this guy will jump off with you or you can jump off by yourself if you know how to do it. But uh, it's quite spectacular, as you can see. Just down the track, uh, now heading south and east, is this place called Butterfly Bay. We only ever stop there for a swim stop because it's quite a long day, about 28 miles that particular leg to Kalkan from, uh, uh, from Oladenis. So the next stop, uh, this is after Fethiye, before Kalkan, is called uh, Karachaoren. It's uh, a bit of a trick to pronounce it, and I'm not even sure that I've got it right, and I won't bother to spell it for you. But it's uh, a bay with a single restaurant, that one, and he's got the only moorings. And uh, the only expectation is if he ties you up in front of his restaurant, that you have dinner in his restaurant. And um, we have a famous story from here with the AFL grand final in uh, the year that the Swans beat Hawthorne. And when we rocked up there, I saw he had an antenna on top because I knew that the game was being broadcast live by Eurosport 2 in Europe. And um, actually, I don't see the... Oh, there it is. Yes, the antenna is there. Anyway, he said, look, Trevor, I don't have a subscription to Eurosport 2, but I'll fix something. You leave to me. Next morning, 7.30, because of the time difference, we had the game live in the restaurant in Turkish. So before you could say Jack Robinson, the waiters are all up to speed with goals and Cyril Rioli and Buddy Franklin and others. And at the end of the game, uh, a couple of guys commented they'd never been so sober at the end of the AFL grand final before. And we jumped in the boats and off we went for a sail on the afternoon breeze. And whilst talking about coastal or thermal breezes, you really need to wait until afternoon because the mornings are generally pretty calm when there isn't any system breeze. So this was uh, an excursion that we did. And once again, if we happen to organize it, um, then everybody, of course, goes together. We simply pay the guy and off we go. But we don't try to over-organize. That's what I'm trying to make a point of. This is an excursion to a fam famous place now in Turkey called Kayakoy. It used to be called in... English Times, give me the name, you wrote it, she'd forgotten. Um, but um, in 1923, when the non-Turkish people were kicked out of uh, Turkey by um, Ataturk, then these people were simply rounded up and marched off to a Greek uh, island. And the, for some reason, the Turks didn't want to move into these houses, and so they remain uh, derelict. The interesting thing about that time is that uh, the Armenians and the Greeks and the Turks all lived uh, happily together until the, the nationalist fervor got stirred up by international politics, and you all know the story. And if you don't, um, there's a great book to read called uh, Birds Without Wings. It's by Louis de Bernier, who is an English author. It is a novel, but it's based on history. And the other one is Paradise Lost by a guy called Giles Milton. That's a history book to do with the recent history of the Ottoman Turks and the new history of uh, Kemal Ataturk. Fantastic reading 
fantastic history and it's spooky to walk around in this place, like, let me tell you. So, of course, being uh, a Greek town originally, um, Levisa, by the way, Maggie, is the name of the place. <laughs> it's the Greek name of the place. But uh, these are remnants of the Byzantium period, which preceded, of course, the Turks in Istanbul and in Turkey. Um, and some of its remains, there are talks about making a movie of this book there, but I haven't seen anything start yet. I should, we put this one in because this gives you an idea of how the countryside looks in this neck of the woods. These pines and the olive trees come all the way down to uh, the road. It's quite a steep walk up to the town from the, the port, but nothing untoward, but beautiful, beautiful aroma, of course, and uh, shaded from the heat of summer. Talking about summer, obviously the fiercest months are July and August, April, May, June, September, October are the best, but if you're on a boat and uh, it's air conditioned, it doesn't matter anyway. But one thing I need to say now that the Turks are not great at is building jetties. <laughs> and I have, an, I have it on good authority that they didn't have a DA or a BA for this particular jetty, but obviously neither did they have a power driver. There is a nearby bay next near to Jan. This is Jan's place where you sit along the rail here and uh, overlook the anchorage. Uh, I've never seen many more people there than that. Uh, maybe a couple more boats but it's a beautiful, clean, clear swimming, interesting walking. There is no road to this, house, to this restaurant. And um, it's just a great place to be. It's beautifully protected. It's landlocked to the west, which is where the wind comes from if it comes. And if you're not happy with uh, anchorages like this, this one being, of course, just a tad crowded, and that's all on anchor, by the way, that one, and sometimes you've got to be careful with the depth because that's got to be eight or nine metres, 60, 60 metres out or 50 metres out. And then you just tie a stern line to the rocks there and you're safe as a house. Um, yes, sir? Am I right in saying you basically have no tide there? Uh, look, about a half a metre, a bit less. Yeah, yeah. Not much more than that. Less, Maggie's saying. Um, no, no, not much tide and not much current either. Sometimes when you have this Meltimi blowing for an extended period of time, uh, you can get a current on the surface. But frankly, we set up this trip, for example, to be running with whatever happens anyway. And we do it on a one-way basis so that when we get to the end, rather than take the boats back against the wind, we give them back to the operator, the charter boats anyway, and um, they take them back, much easier. Custom exactly. <laughs> And if the tucker doesn't suit, well, you get Uber Eats, as Maggie calls it. Um, this girl is making goslemi on the spot, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with goslemi. It's beautiful stuff. They're great people, these people, the merchants. They're very friendly, clean, and uh, very funny. Then you're off to uh, from Kalkan to Cash. You know, that's an epic journey of nearly 10 miles. Um, it, however, takes you to a very, very <laughs> slick uh, marina owned by Setur from Istanbul, who own nine others, I think. And it's brand new, this one, when I say brand new, it's probably three years old. And um, Cash as a place to get into with a cat is a bit tricky, especially if you're with a group, as I hope you might be, um, but even as a single boat, because the port is very, very small. Um, but this marina is very flash, beautiful restaurants, great facilities. Waiting for the, here we go. And um, we didn't get there yet. That's a shame. Once again, an example of the wind coming off the shore, 
as it does uh, thermally and uh, flat water, beautiful sailing, autopilot. If we do this racing thing, we, we allow autopilots. When you get to cash, of course, one of the things that Maggie and I did, not, that's either her or me, I'm not sure, but uh, we jumped off the mountain up to the left and uh, landed on the quay. Nearly got tangled up in that mizzen mast there, but actually missed it by more than what it looks like in that picture. Of course, this is Sarah's famous story that involves Sarah and Maggie. So I'm going to flip past now to Sarah to tell it to you. It's very funny. Well, I think so. <laughs> so this beautiful, beautiful man, how handsome is he? Um, has a little shop and in the little shop he has a cowbell. I hadn't been out of Australia for quite some years raising kids but I got there and I fell in love with a cowbell. I'm not sure why I would fall in love with a cowbell but that's what I did and I fell in love with a cowbell but I didn't have any money with me so this very charming and lovely man gave me his business card and told me to transfer him $50 when I got back to Australia, um, which I promised that I would. I got back to Australia, by which time I had lost the business card. I had no way of contacting him. We didn't run a rally the next year. I had this on my mind that I had basically run away with a cowbell and not paid this gorgeous man in Italy doing the best he can to earn a living. Two years later, Maggie and Trevor went back for the next rally. I asked them, please walk up the hill, go to that man, give him $50. Mum did that. And when she walked in the door and said, my daughter, and started to tell the story, he said, yes, yes, yes. She has two beautiful girls. I gave her a cowbell and I haven't heard from her since. <laughs> she, Mum gave him $50. He friend book, he Facebook me and we are still friends to this day and he's a truly truly lovely man and actually that is not an unusual story because they are all so generous and lovely and want to take care of us which we probably don't deserve or not and you still have the cowbell <laughs> of course i still have the cowbell oh my goodness as if i would lose the cowbell <laughs> So. Um, from uh, Cash, you can do a land excursion for them into history. And uh, this can be a bit of a exercise if you're there in the middle of summer, but nonetheless, the history is extraordinary. This is a place called Xanthos, which of course was uh, Greek, and that's all that's left of it, but it's a sort of a kit that you have to do. But on the same excursion, you can go to a place which is quite exciting called Saklikent Gorge, which I think is next. Yes, this Saklikent Gorge um, takes water from inside the mountain and actually you can't get an idea of it here, but it comes out of the mountain with such force. They use it for uh, hydroelectric power and if there are any electrical engineers in the gathering, I'd love to know what the story is. But Turkey apparently generates 433 gigawatts, I guess that is, um, of electricity using um, uh, hydroelectricity, which I think is a hell of a lot more than Australia, but maybe it's an unrealistic comparison too. But um, the other thing that's good on these excursions and that the Turks are good at is making ice cream. Um, and uh, this is in Saklikent, where the water source is actually twofold. One it comes from snow and comes roaring down this valley, and one it comes from inside the mountains, artesian water, I think they call it. And then if you don't want to do anything, you just uh, anchor off the beach and have a swim. The water is fantastically clean. You might not think having seen some of these awful documentaries about the Med, they've made huge efforts to tidy it all up and it's been effective in most places. Um, and um, 
so it's somewhere nice and clean to go. But if you don't want to go to the beach or you want to stop along the way, this is the destination. Kush uh, is the, the marina that I'm talking about, operated and owned by Setour. And this will be the terminus for our rally, but we're going past it to come back again and uh, make it easier to access for people leaving and going, et cetera. It's brand new, very well done and uh, not expensive. I would say typically for a catamaran, uh, maybe not cheap. A catamaran, uh, let's say an Astro 42 would cost about 180 euros a night. You've paid that a few times, haven't you? Would you reckon that to be about the number or is it a bit less than that? I couldn't tell you. I can see all the receipts in my hand. So I can't remember what I paid. <laughs> but uh, look, actually, Trevor, I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if Michael and Marita are uh, listening to David. They've been over there and obviously living there at the moment. We've also, uh, it's interesting. We just had another client, uh, Don, just email or message a question to say that he's also got an apartment in. Uh, in Bodrum and loves visiting each year. So we might see if any of those guys have got a, a up-to-date idea of marina charges in a, in a marina like yeah. Casa Marina there. The most expensive of all of them is Bodrum, but this one is pretty good. So this is from the restaurant that we use in town in Cash, looking out over the sea, of course. And um, uh, I can't talk highly enough about food, about wine, about service, attitude uh, in these restaurants in Turkey. They are just beautiful places to go for dinner. Now, girls, tell me how much dinner there cost that night ahead. It was 30 euros, wasn't it, with wine and dessert? I honestly don't know, but it's not, not a big, not it's not a big, big deal. No. Yeah. <laughs> Look, My information sources are drying up here, <laughs> Greg. I'm sorry, man. No, the problem is that you have such an acute awareness of numbers, and neither Maggie or I have the same attention. We have the experience recalled in our brain, but not the actual figures. Okay, fair <laughs> okay. Well, I think I think the fact I think the fact that you can't remember is a good indication that you didn't. Yes, get absolutely. Well done. Thanks. <laughs> The other thing we do, which creates a lot of fun, is remember, of course, uh, the important occasions. Although, uh, of course, birthdays are the obvious ones. We have had a divorce, but it happened at the end of the trip, thank goodness. <laughs> it wasn't Trevor's and mine. No. <laughs> and we've had quite a few uni unions, but they haven't all been recorded. So this is another little great story. This is Lycian, and the writing on the tomb is Lycian. I was standing by the side trying to decipher what I thought was Greek because I read a bit of the uppercase Greek. And this little Turkish guy came up to me, and I'm standing at the level you can see just at the bottom of the picture. He's... I, he said, would you like uh, to, me to read this for you? I said, that would be fantastic. Thank you. He said, and he pointed to the line. I think it was uh, the line, the first line in the first block pointing to something. Doesn't make any difference, does it? He said, in my carpet shop, I have very nice carpet with special price just for you. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out to be a myth. Anyway, so um, of course, the, the shopping uh, for them, not uh, what's the word, motivated, it can get a bit over the top. But frankly, if somebody says to you, I'm not interested, generally speaking, they'll back off and leave you alone. These are the merchants. Oh, they'll make you a nice cup of or they'll, tea. They'll make you a nice, very, very true. They'll I make you a nice you a cup of tea. Yes. Sit down yes. and yes. relax. Yes, yes. And you can still, after you've had your apple tea and had a chat, quietly leave them and say goodbye with a big smile, and that's absolutely fine. The next day when you walk past, they'll be waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> so from cash, 
it's all of two nautical miles, maybe a bit less, across to the Greek island of Castellorizo. Castellorizo, um, at the end of all of this um, geopolitical stuff in the Second World War, etc., cetera, um, became Greek, although it was decreed by the International Court of The Hague that if the permanent Greek population of Castellorizo ever fell below 200, then the sovereignty of Castellorizo would revert to Turkey. And that's Turkey, you can see top left picture. That's a, like I said, about, it's not even two miles. And you will also see interestingly at the point there, at the end of that picture, a mosque. And the mosque has been preserved as a museum. And we've been there luckily on occasions when it's been open. And there's a little old Greek guy that does a service and tells the story of Castellorizo, which is tragic, as you can imagine. There was a huge explosion in this port during the Second War when somebody got at the military, the ammunition dump, and nearly took the whole town uh, to, to the sky. But there's a beautiful um, bloom. Um, I just had a, something, an interruption here, train of thought. Um, this is a, um, what do they call that thing in Italy? The Blue Grotto. The Blue Grotto. Great to get into because actually you have to lie down in the boat to get through the hole and then you're into this place. And then at the dock there, you'll see this tor turtle. He's been coming there apparently for years. Um, the permanent population of Castle Orizo, as far as I know today, is 201. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, um, occupational health and safety doesn't really prevail in this neck of the woods. So they've got all these restaurants, these tables along the quay. Next one is good to um, give you a better perspective. So you can keep an eye on the boat. The restaurant, of course, is back to the left of the picture by all of seven, eight, nine, ten meters. Once we went there and uh, one of the guys stepped ashore after I suggested we stay for lunch, he said to me, Trevor, we're not staying here for lunch. We're staying here for dinner. We're staying here for breakfast and maybe we'll leave tomorrow. Well, we had to adjust the plan and we did. So once again, this is Greek and it's only two miles away and you wouldn't recognize it if you were to park it in one of those Turkish ports because of course they're totally different. The other interesting little dimension here, which I want to mention is that these Greeks in Kazi, uh, and lots of them live in Kingsford, these Greeks used to have to go to Rhodes shopping for their food, for the restaurants. Rhodes is 90 miles away from here. Recently, I don't know, no, not quite recently, I'm talking two or three years ago, the traders, the people within the town in Kash and in Kazi got themselves together and made the way possible for the merchants to come to Turkey instead of going to Rhodos to provision their restaurants. Now that spirit, prevails at ground level, and that's another thing I just wanted to dwell on for a moment, all around the border between Greece and Turkey, you hear all kinds of stuff, but in fact, one-on-one, -on -one, half of them are related to each other anyway. A lot of the Turks have origins with the Pontic Greeks who come from the Baltic, and a lot of the Greeks <laughs> have intermarriage with the Turks over the years, and frankly, they don't give a damn about politicians and the likes. So the scene is peaceful on the local front. And this to me is one of the pictures of the whole exercise. And that is Turkey in the background. Kash is down behind that uh, little pinnacle that you can see near the point. And there you see the uh, mosque at the right-hand side of the picture. Great place to go. Great place to sail too, because you get these breezes and flat water. And um, we um, we did a bit of a race. This racing thing 
uh, unnerves a lot of people. And if they don't want to do it, they don't have to anyway. Some people like to have a play, but we only do it with a small p anyway. And this guy, uh, I thought maybe was a bit close just there, but anyway, he didn't hit anything, but it's a beautiful shot. So then you come into this place called Kekova Roads and Kekova Roads has an island in the picture or at the back of me and I'm looking at the picture. There's an entrance either end, otherwise this body of water is completely landlocked. And uh, therefore there are one, two, three, four, five anchorages there, just beautiful, drop the pick, fall overboard, look at the sky, rediscover the meaning of life, whatever. It's also a bit of a climb to get up to the top. And this castle is, I think, Crusader or Ottoman in vintage. I'm not 100% sure. Once upon a time, they used to illuminate it at night. And frankly, it looked uh, quite surrealistic. The only problem with getting up the top of the hill here is getting past the merchants who want to sell you something. But if you're parked at the key at the bottom, all you have to do is to go to the restaurant of the people who own the dock. And this is on the opposite side of this waterway on the uh, western side. And uh, underneath here is the sunken city or the remains thereof. It's not even actually allowed to swim there, but somebody wanted to do it, so they did. And this is, uh, Maggie calls them uh, tombs. I read the other day that they're called sarcophagus, but they come from the Lycian area and the end result is the same. There are lots of them around the place. They're not beach houses. And this is looking down into the water. At one end of this gulf or the, the Gekwa, you go across a small isthmus and there's another one of these towns that actually not many people go to and you can swim there and it is you can see a street with houses along the side of the street probably because of an earthquake that it sunk because it's not widespread in Turkey that you actually see this but certainly in Kekwa you see it. So which hilltop fort is that, Maggie? That's the um, that's the theatre, um, and the fort's off the top. Oh, sorry. Um, the, yes, yes, yes. At Kekova, uh, yes. Mm. Uh, Saint Nicholas is the name of the church. Uh, <laughs> sorry, not the church. The name of the castle, um, and that's the Greek theatre. So you know, everybody's had a go at um, modelling these things. Again, more tombs in deference to Maggie. And now we're in a place called Antalya, which we don't actually take the boats to, but if you're there on your own boat, it's only a hop and a step really to get to Antalya from Kekova, I would say 40, 50 miles. There's a very good marina there, also set tour, but the old town of uh, Antalya is brilliant. This is uh, typical good restaurants, a couple of good hotels we use. And normally with our rally, what we do is put an overnight in the hotel in Antalya in the package, because we have to get off the boats earlier than normal to give them time to get back to the base for the Saturday start. But beautiful place in the old city. You ought to see what they've done with the new bit. Don't go anywhere near it. Um, it's a mass tourism hub for people coming out of Germany, going to the beach, but they don't come anywhere near the old town. And most of them sit by the pool or by the beach to get as red as they possibly can in the quickest possible time. And this is what you do when the boss turns up. This is Hadrian's Gate in uh, Antalya. And uh, he was there in about 130 AD. I don't know how long it took them to knock the, the triumphant uh, arch together, but uh, he was Roman, of course, and came all the way from Rome to Antalya to check out the scene. 
And so this is Hadrian's Gate in Antalya, quite ar ar archaeologically famous. Again, more carpet shop. <laughs> and more night uh, seen in Antalya. We found a nightclub there once. I doubt that I could ever find it again. It may not even be open, but we didn't even go until 11 o'clock. And I have no idea what time we left, but it was certainly next morning. Um, maybe this is a good opportunity to restate what I've said about the Turks. All of our experience with them has been fantastic. Uh, they are humorous, communicative, they are diligent, they want to please, um, sometimes a little bit to their own detriment because they will tend to say what they know you want to hear. But um, I work with trusted sources there. SK, as I said at the outset, have been with us for years and years. We think about 25, maybe even 30, something like that. Um, Metin and I are blood brothers, and we won't tell you how we got to be blood brothers. But anyway, it's been a fantastic experience for me, and the Turks are absolutely brilliant, and I love them dearly. And um, this thing at the top is blocking me from saying, don't be in a hurry to leave. And in fact, uh, I would be suggesting that you even extend beyond the single day if you're on a charter package and stay longer in uh, Antalya, or go then to central Turkey. This is in the Gorama Valley. Cappadocia is the region. And it's made, Maggie, what do you call the stuff that comes out of the volcanoes? Tufa. I thought tufa was something on a stick that you had as a sweet. Anyway, the best view of this area is pre-dawn or as the dawn comes in the morning. And you get up there in a balloon and we had the time we went, 90 of them all up at the same time. Spectacular view, an extraordinary experience. And if you go to Turkey and miss it, you'll wish you hadn't. I think that's the best thing to say. And so far as the rally is concerned, if you've got your own boat and you're lucky, you travel with us, but participate nonetheless. If you want to charter, you can. If you want to take a cabin on a boat, we can work on that basis as well. Um, and as Maggie has said here, you're working in a place or living in a place that's full of history with a population of the most friendly, welcoming people you will find anywhere. And I bet if there's some people from Turkey watching at the moment, you would be able to hear applause. Has there anybody got any questions? Yeah, we do, Trevor. And first of all, thank you to yourself and Maggie and Sarah today for uh, presenting you. You have a, a, a wonderful style and a passion. Uh, the passion that you all have for Turkey always oozes out over the uh, over the broadcast. So once again, a fantastic effort. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And before, before we roll into the questions, I just want to remind everyone that part of the reason we've We've done this uh, presentation with, with Mariner Boating today is because we are working in partnership to have a Mediterranean escapade. It was supposed to happen last year. It was sold out, actually. Uh, and obviously that got put on hold. We thought we might do it this year. That got put on hold. But we have scheduled it for next year, uh, from May the 14th to May the 28th. Uh, and that is... Uh, there's opportunities there for people to come on board and, and through Mariner Boating uh, join in the charter either as a whole boat or by, by the cabin. And there's also an opportunity, as Trevor is saying on this page here, for people to uh, bring their own boat and join in uh, and, and uh, join in the fun uh, aboard their own boat. And we, we have a number of uh, our clients who have been... Um, uh, who all have their boats in that region. And it's interesting today that uh, some of the questions we have, Trevor, are for people who have tuned in today who are uh, over there in, in Turkey or who have connections with Turkey like yourself. So, for instance, we've got Don, who's come in a couple of times. He, 
as I said earlier, he's, um, uh, what Don say, he said, bear with me, just want to emphasize how wonderful for sailing in Turkey is. We've sailed there many times, the food, the people and the history. We now have an apartment in Bodrum and enjoy yearly visits, counting down the days till we can visit the Lycian coast again. And, and then he also just finished off by mentioning that the stone tombs are believed to be upturned boats. And the belief is that when they overturn in storms, the souls of the fishermen will be, will be forever free. How nice is that? So another demonstration of someone who's passionate about Turkey. So good to have you with us today, Don. Now, Trevor, back to some questions. Yes, sir. Um, we do have a couple. Um, First of all, we do have someone who has straight away asked for you, so we'll talk to you afterwards. Someone has straight away said, please send me more info on the syndicate. So that okay. worked. <laughs> Good. Um, and then someone did ask the name of the marina at SK, where SK Yachting is, but I did answer that on your behalf. It's the Marmorous Yacht Marina. Well, actually, Greg, can um, I, and then, it's a bit strange yes. before you move on. They spell... Yacht Marine, Y A T for yacht, and Marine the way we spell it. Normally, the way the Turks spell it is M A R I N, but it's Marine, yes. first word, yacht, Y A T. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, understood. And you need so, to ask for Metin. If you're ringing up, you ask for Metin, M E T I N. Gotcha. All right. Very good. And then, um, one, uh, as you know, we've got Michael and Marita who uh, at this stage, uh, fingers crossed, will be uh, working or, or, or partnering with us next year to uh, help host uh, the, the escapade. Uh, they just did uh, tune in earlier to say that you can get a nice bottle of wine for around 100 lira in a restaurant. So that's not even 20 bucks, that is it? Ring true. <laughs> Yes, I would say that. No, no, no. And that's a current price because Michael and Marina are in Turkey as we speak. I, um, I believe they're in um, in Fetier, so on their Elba 45. Uh, and then um, we've also got another gentleman there. Rob uh, has also asked for information on the syndicate chair. So hopefully this has been a worthwhile afternoon, Trevor. Um, and then um, uh, we also... Uh, found out that the, you, the the suggestion is that it's about a hundred euros upwards to berth a catamaran in the marina in Paris. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's good. Yeah. Yep. And then, um, do you know? And if you don't, maybe one of those who are from, uh, over there in Turkey at the moment. What are the rules for grey water and black water um, <laughs> in in Turkey? Yes, that's a very good question, and I'm not sure I do know the answer. I know you, in the big marinas you can get black water pump out, of course. Um, grey water, they will say, go two miles offshore and leave it there. Okay. And I really don't know what the last, and I would actually, I'd like to know, and I should have checked it up and I didn't think of it, my apology. But there are facilities emerging hither and thither and of course, the Turks have legislated that all charter yachts have to have holding tanks, um, but I don't know what they do. They're empty. Yeah, no, it's, a good, it's a good question because all of the Fontaine Bejos and all of the Dew Fours, they all have black water tanks fitted now as normal. Oh, uh, really? But I don't, but it's, it's, uh, it's not even a factory option to fit grey water tanks. So if you need grey water tanks fitted, that's a post factory option. So it is a really good question. Big one to uh, hopefully by the time we finish here, someone might chime in with an answer. Well, Michael, uh, should, Michael must. Yeah, he might know. Yeah. <laughs> because um, his, his new boat has just been delivered. So whatever he needs, he's done, I would have yes. thought. But I don't know if he's still on. He might. Have, oh, here we go. The answers are coming in. Here we go. Um, <laughs> okay, so boats must have. Uh, thank you, Michael, Lysa, or, or should I say Michael and Marita, because I reckon they're both typing. Uh, boats must have holding tank and be blue card registered, pump out on a regular basis. Grey water tanks are not required. 
There are pump outs at the bigger marinas, e.g. Calcan and Cas. Thank you very much. And then there's a comment here from someone who you might know, uh, I'd say uh, from Susan, permission to come aboard, Captain Sue Charnook, Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Do you know Sue? Canada, Canada yes. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Hi, Sue. <laughs> Hi, Sue, I think you're all out of board. And then, um, and then Ian has asked, I take it in Kusadasi Marmara's trip is on hold for the sea, but yeah, so Ian, as we've said, it's on hold at the moment and we will hope, uh, we have scheduled at the moment to, uh, for Marin and Boating to run that in May of 2022. Uh, and so we'll be able to watch over the coming three to six months how uh, the world is evolving, uh, but at this stage, We've been um, glass half full people rather than glass half empty. From a glass half full perspective, we're all hoping that we can uh, go and put some of our well-earned uh, um, earnings into the uh, Turkish tourism economy again. Greg, Greg, I've just got to tell you a little funny aside on this um, note. This year during COVID, SK were renting their charter boats for people doing quarantine on the boat instead of in a hotel yes. and the restaurant in the in the marina was delivering food to the boat so they didn't have to violate the terms of their quarantine yes so, yeah. that's a bit of lateral thinking isn't it all right so listen trevor we've taken up uh, enough of everyone's time thank um, you so much everybody I think uh, fantastic uh, the presentation that uh, Sarah, as uh, as we talked before, Sarah is the CEO. So let's not forget that Sarah, the, the ah. and, and Maggie, Maggie, who I call the uh, the puppet master. And <laughs> so you guys have done a fantastic job. And Trevor, as always, in your unique style, you've been brilliant today, and it's it's really good. We enjoy having you. And there's a lot of people just mentioning there, saying that they've had a wonderful presentation and thank you very much. So I'm not sure if you can see the Q and A's, but uh, yeah, people have enjoyed your presentation. Thank you thank so you. much, Greg. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rachel, Bye. for your te technical skills. It just blows me away every time. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And so on that note, folks, thanks for joining in. Thanks for asking all the questions. And for those who are in Turkey or, or uh, uh, we'll be going to Turkey this season, stay in touch, and uh, we, we look forward to uh, staying in communication with everyone. Although I do see that we just got one last question. It's just a thank you from Diane. Thank you. And, uh, and oh, sorry, and that's from Diane and Peter who are uh, in Fetia. So everyone's in, there's a lot of Australian yacht owners in, in uh, Turkey at the moment, Trevor. Yes, I'm aware of that. And uh, I hope to see them next yeah. May. See you in Turkey. <laughs> All right. So on that note, we'll sign off. So uh, I Thanks, think Greg. Rachel will uh, Rachel will cut the transmission. Thank you. <laughs>